Hello and welcome. My name is Mary Rose Somariba with Natural Womanhood. And today I'm so pleased to sit down with Obianuju Akocha, author of Target Africa and head of Culture of Life Africa. Um, and she's sitting with me today from London to talk about her book and how contraceptive campaigns are taking place in Africa and what that means for African women. Welcome. Thank you, Mary Rose. Thanks for having me. I'm so pleased to be speaking with you today and hoping we can get through just the, this very important topic and get people listening and thinking about these issues. Right, I'm so glad. And um, I will start off with just introducing readers to this book. I really want you all to check out the link for the book, um, Target Africa, it came out in 2018. Um, and it does really paint a larger picture than we can go into for the course of this interview, but I would love to just start. Um, and as as you're often uh, called by friends and other, uh, Uju, uh, thank you again. Um, your letter to Melinda Gates was really gained a lot of attention um, when you were raising concerns years ago about how African women would respond to the dollars of aid going toward contraceptive campaigns over more pressing needs. Um, did Melinda Gates, I'm curious, did she ever reply to your letter? You're right, that, that letter actually was what got me started on this path because before then I really had all the views I have now. I was convinced, but then I wasn't really activist. Uh, so I had written the letter, it was back in 2012. So anybody who wants to see what you're talking about, you can either see uh, the entire letter in the book, Target Africa, or you can also see just the letter online. It's the, um, a Nigerian woman's open letter to Melinda Gates. Uh, to answer your question, no, Melinda Gates never replied directly to uh, the the letter that uh, that I wrote, the open letter that that I had addressed to her. Um, but because by just by the mere virtue of the fact that it had gone viral, it was also translated into many languages. I think about six or seven different languages. Uh, people were reading it in as far you know as Slovakia, places that I had never really even thought about. Um, I believe. Uh, in all honesty, that the, her, at least the organization would have known about it. Uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, of course, they're well-connected organization. They have networks in various countries and all whatnot, and they have their, their fingers on the pulse of, uh, of everything happening around the world, especially when an African is saying something as important as an opposition to one of their major projects or headline projects at the time and still continues to be a headline project for them. Uh, so I do believe that they had known about it. They had heard about it. Some of the subsequent interviews that they were having after that letter, open letter went viral, uh, really indicated that they, you know, it seemed as if they were kind of responding to it, you know, because they were being asked things like, what do you do when there are these kinds of oppositions against, against uh, your project for, for pl family planning, so-called family planning in Africa? So they did hear about it, but unfortunately, they never replied directly, which goes to show as well uh, the level of respect or non, not respect, non respect that they have for the really the African voices. They come and they say they are friends, but then when things like this happen, when they could have either sat with me or talked with me or listened to me, uh, then that they didn't take that opportunity and still haven't. Uh, it's now more than eight years. So it just goes oh. to show you uh, the, the mindset, I think, of some of these donors who come to Africa. That is really sad. I'm really sad to hear that. Um, and especially if it's roundabout way and not addressing you uh, directly as the person who raised these concerns on behalf of African women. And, um, and especially as outlined in your book, this, the picture is painted of this thinking of, well, we know what's better and we're just gonna encourage it whether or not we're listening to the people we're supposedly helping. Um, and that continues to this day and uh, so I guess more recently in the Mexico, Mexico City policy, people are talking about it a little more. Can you tell how, while well, that's often discussed in the terms of providing abortions overseas, um, the United States doing so um, with funds, can you talk about how it also promotes contraceptives to countries in Africa? Right, so Mexico City policy, yes, it, I know from the, you know, if you look at the larger picture, uh, the first thing or the loudest thing you would hear, of course, is that it is about uh, the um, uh, promotion of abortion 
overseas. So Western nations, particularly the United States in this very case, the Mexico City policy really is about the United States through its executive arm, being able to fund organizations that either promote or provide abortions uh, overseas. Now, what people don't really think much about is the secondary effect of what the Mexico City policy really is all about. Um, mind you, the, this is about funding organizations that decide and who are quite uh, serious about, about promoting abortion. These are still the same organizations that are by data, uh, the most fervent about Pro, you know, promoting contraception in any country they go to, because anyone who is very careful or, you know, very attentive to these issues, I would say, would realize that, uh, you know, anyone who is promoting a, uh, contraception is usually the gateway in this way, you know, like a mass uh, population control style um, contraceptive device sharing, promoting, uh, you know, uh, they, you would realize that they go hand in hand. These organizations like International Planned Parenthood Federation, Mary Stokes International, uh, DKT International, they come first and foremost with contraceptives because many of the countries do not even have legal abortion. So when they go there, they don't tell the countries we've come to give you abortion. They usually come with a huge uh, extensive contraception project. And these contraceptive projects um, usually, you know, very, um, you know, they're very widespread, they're very, they're very much well-funded, they are very extensive and expansive and expensive even. So because they are, they have this sort of funding which is needed, funding from the United States is no small deal. Anyone who works with, you know, around humanitarian aid and if you know how the funding works and how the cash flow comes, the U.S. is the highest funder, you know, with international development spending in the world. They are number one. And so when the Mexico City policy was in place, um, the, the effect of that was that an organization like International Planned Parenthood Federation, they were cut off from a lot of funds. Um, an organization like Marie Stops International, yet another well-known, you know, very well known in the area of population control, contraceptive device sharing and all whatnot, they were also really in, affected by it because the US was uh, one of their largest funders. So they lost all that money, but with what has happened now in the United States, which happened you know, in, at the end of January of this year, uh, when the new president of the United States decided that he was going to completely overturn the Mexico City policy, it then meant that they, the United States taxpayers have to now go back into the business of funding these organizations uh, that are, you know, who are very well known and very, um, you know, almost unstoppable as long as they have funding in the countries where they do what they do. So it, the, the fact that the Mexico City policy has now been overturned, it really is bad news uh, for anybody who is considering uh, what, will, what will happen in the wake of these organizations that are now going to get that funding um, in African countries and other parts of the developing world. That's a, that's a big shame. And, and just to draw, just to make it clear for any listeners here, um, what does it look like when these contraceptive campaigns hit in Africa? What actually does it look like in those communities? How yeah, is it so implemented? Yeah, so uh, of course, when you, if you went to any of the websites of these uh, massive Western organizations that are reproductive rights organizations, you will present it like it's, it's something good that they're doing, they are meeting on met needs, and they're helping women to avoid pregnancy, they're saving lives, you know, there's all kinds of ways that they put it. But it only takes you just pulling back the layers a little bit and you find out the sorts of um, techniques and, stand and standards that these organizations take up. So I'll give you some examples. Uh, a couple of years ago, Marie Stokes International uh, was in Kenya. They were trying to promote some sort of contraception program at a school. And uh, a few days later, some parents, some 
PTA members, so the, the parents in that school uh, started raising alarm because what happened where the, the parents were finding their young children, minors who went to secondary school to learn, they had, uh, you know, um, in, in these, uh, they had injectables uh, given to them, injectable contraceptives, and they had uh, subcutaneous contraceptives given to them. So. Uh, it, it was really terrible and the parents were raising alarm and they were, uh, they were saying that somebody had to be brought to justice for it. So you find these organizations, this is not the only case, this, there's many, many cases like that where they go into schools, they say they've come to give sex ed and then once they're giving access to the children, they begin to give contraceptives to minors. We find cases where they go into villages with uh, their mobile clinics. So there are parts of rural African uh, communities where you, as you can imagine, maybe there would be not even be any passable roads. You know, it's very difficult to get to those, those communities unless you have like a four wheel drive, unless you, you know, you have the kind of resources that you need to get into those villages and communities. Now, Marie Stokes International and other like-minded organizations, they do have the funding. So definitely they can get to these uh, very rural communities. They go in with what they call their mobile clinics. They start to roll out contraceptives without full, fully informing uh, the women. At least this is what people have alleged. Uh, sometimes we talk to women and they tell you that they haven't even, they, they didn't explain to them well enough what will happen or the side effects that could happen. So they come in with their mobile clinics, they accept sharing contraceptives. The problem with that is that once they finish their work on that day, they leave. They don't get to come back. They don't get to take medical history. They don't get to come back to check if anybody has any problems or any side effects or anybody reacting to them or any difficulties that have occurred as a result of their, you know, their contraceptive sharing mission. So they do their work and they disappear simply because they have the funding. Uh, we find cases where also the uh, reproductive rights organizations get to incentivize the sharing of these contraceptive de devices. They go into communities, they find a few village leaders, uh, they either give them things or, you know, bribe them almost, if I can say that, or give them incentives that would then make them you know, push them to then in turn go into their communities to start bringing out these poor women uh, to, to take contraceptives without full, uh, full information. So these are some of the problematic things that we have found. There is um, a place that I was reading about in Tanzania where somebody was making a very important uh, commentary about this, this uh, village or community. And I believe that it's not just this one community in Tanzania, there are so many places like that in African communities where if you only look, it will be the same complaint. Now the person said they've had to close down uh, a few primary schools in the village. Why? Uh, because there were no children to go to those schools. But these are schools that had been in these communities for you know, for decades. But at this point in time, some of the contraceptive projects have gotten to that point of successful population control, that it is now in turn affecting demography in parts of African, uh, in uh, parts of rural Africa where no one is looking and no one is taking pictures, but we just don't have. Um, enough children to go to schools in, in some of the communities. And that already spells out uh, a, da a danger to the what will happen demographically for this particular community or these particular communities. So these are things that come directly from Western funded contraception types uh, type projects. Uh, and yet nobody seems as if nobody is really taking a full count of what is going on. Oh my goodness. Well, this uh, this clear this is starting to peel back the layers, as you said. And a big concern yeah. is the thought of mobile clinics going in and shooting women with shots of Depo-Provera and things that are very actually have been shown in studies to be very dangerous and have yeah. very problematic side effects, and then leaving them with no access to healthcare for help after that. Um, just outrageous. And also with the, the stories of the children in schools. Uh, yeah. How can parents help take care of them with the side effects if they don't even know what's happening? Um, By all so means, and even without any consent as well. Without so, consent is the ugliest yeah. part because 
Yeah. It's all about, we're supposed to be about, in healthcare, it's supposed to be about informed consent and yes. and also access uh, to healthcare. And if you're just administering something without full knowledge of the of the full extent of its um, uh, possible effects, and then yeah. being left, um, it's just, it's just really ugly. Um, it is, and it's unfortunate because the, the taxpayers in Western countries, say, you know, the United States, for example, are paying for these projects um, without meaning to, without knowing, but your taxpayers, your taxpayers' dollars are being used to, to fund the projects and to keep them going, and it is hurting people. Um, it's causing a lot of health issues. It's causing a lot of complications. It's causing um, sometimes even damage within families where whereby you know women are coming down with these side effects and things like that and there is almost no recourse to anyone there's the, you know these people are so low uh, in the chain of things that they cannot even take recourse to say for example the justice system or the legal system they cannot do any of that and the western organizations know that and by the way for anyone who might be imagining uh, the, these organizations that come into Africa to do these things, to share contraceptives and, and, you know, almost trick people into having it by not giving full and informed consent. Um, they, if you think about it, the executives are on six-figure salaries, easily verifiable. They are on six-figure salaries just because they are being funded by Western taxpayers. So it's really heavy money. They are living well. Some of them are living in hotels. They are, you know, they're living the, the fast life, the easy life, just so that they can create an entire new market of women who will be dependent on contraceptives in Africa. So there, there are a lot of sides to this. So there is the one side, which is just how they are marketing this thing in, in, in African uh, towns and villages and how they are hurting women in the process. So there is all those concerns. But just on the other side as well, there is just this irresponsible side of it that is almost like a money laundering uh, exercise where money is flowing through and there's almost no oversight. Um, there is also just another side that you could almost view from a human rights perspective. Where is the human, you know, where are they respecting the human rights of the African people when they are looking at us and just seeing us as just, um, you know, a, a place where they can come and dump things and dump their contraceptives and you know, as long as they can get those numbers flowing and you read their reports at the end, you can see they're very happy. They are saying they've shared this amount of millions of contraceptives in this place, this, you know, they've, they've had an increase of contraception here, there and the other. Uh, but a lot of these projects are very uh, much, um, you know, forced through, forced through only because there is a lot of money and funding behind uh, those, uh, you know, those projects. You know, and I, I, the vivid example you gave in the book of how it doesn't it's not charitable when you imagine it. if your neighbor's house is burned down and you walk over and you say hey you are struggling here has some food and some things and a box of condoms that would not be that would be offensive and that's how you're saying it feels from the african perspective there to be told don't don't reproduce you know but we know it's better for you uh yeah that's um well, since, you know, as you were mentioning, there is a lot of money behind mm -hmm. these things. It yeah. really does alter the image, the mirage, I think, um, of, of the reproductive choice that is being, being said, because a lot of people hold up contraceptives, especially in the Western um, world of just, you know, this is, this is a good thing. We're helping people be more, have more freedom and choice. But, but when you look a little closer, it looks like the acceptance the acceptance of these contraceptive campaigns isn't really a free choice for African countries or those ministers yeah. of health and even African people due to all these pressures. Can you elaborate a little bit about how that in, 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 you know, gets in the way of free choice there? Definitely. So the, the one thing that happens in, in the West, I think if, uh, just at the foundation of every major project of culture like this um, is, um, the language. It is the language that is being employed and used by the people who come in. Um, now they, for a couple of you know, years now, they have now been talking about the unmet need. 
they keep talking about the unmet need. We are trying to satisfy the unmet need. And once they talk about the unmet need, Mary Rose, it is something which I find quite um, astounding because we have so many unmet needs in African countries. There are places where people don't even have access to clean drinking water. There are places where people don't have, um, you know, they, they don't even have education for their children. They don't have, you know, food and, and you know, all the basic human needs. But then the U UN, the international community and these organizations come in and they say, we want to deal with the unmet need. When they start, talking like that, um, already that affects the perception of the people because they think this has to be something good, right? It's something we need. But when you look on ground, what data would show you and really what I have seen in practice and, and experience is that a lot of women do not want these contraceptives. Uh, when when they, you know, when, when you look at the, the numbers, you see that a lot of the women, because there is such a a resistance or, you know, there's year on year, the, the people who are sharing contraceptives are hoping that they come back at the following year and there's a market for their, you know, a need for their, for their contraceptives. But what they find is that every time they have to keep fighting against the tide, it's like nobody's enthusiastic about it. Um, but you look at the data and you see that the women are saying that they have health concerns. A lot of them know about side effects. Some of them, you know, once they've even heard a rumor of a side effect, then they don't even want to go near that contraceptive drug or this device. Uh, they are talking about the fact that a lot of them are not with their husbands because the husbands may have migrated to, uh, to the city to work. So if they are not really sexually active, so to say, or there's this infrequency, um, then there, there is no, no need for contraception, they're saying. And yet the, the people who have the funding will still want to force it on them. Some of them are saying that they just come from these communities or these communities that are opposed to contraception. So the idea that, that, that somebody would have, you know, uh, these artificial contraceptive drugs and devices, a lot of women uh, have, you know, cultural or religious objections to it. And yet the people who are pushing it keep pushing. Now, if you look down the list of all the reasons why people don't get these contraceptives, only about 8% on the average for Africa say they don't have it because they don't have access to it. So in other words, only about 8% will say we need contraceptives and yet we don't have it. But when these people who are promoting it come through, they all they are saying, is that the 222 million women in the developing world have this unmet need. So they classify everyone, including the people who say, we actually don't need it. Uh, uh, but then they're masking everything with, with the language. So here, here is just a matter of psychology of how the, the donor and the people that the donor uh, you know, have actually strengthened and sent into Africa, how they are setting the tone, how they are leading us and trying to hold us by the hand, even when we don't need, you know, when we don't need, we need, need to be held this way. People know how children are conceived. People know how not to conceive. People know about, you know, natural family planning methods, and they are trying to use it. They are trying to go that path. And yet uh, someone comes from outside with all this money and these artificial contraceptives that, you know, in many ways can be in fact problematic uh, for these communities. And yet they are being forced through. So uh, it's, it's really unfortunate, but these are, these are some of the things that, that you notice and you find out that there is a certain attitude of neocolonialism and cultural imperialism because the only reason I see why they would overlook everybody else and they are treating everyone like the 8% who say, you know, we don't have access to and we want 8%. In fact, it is actually four to 8% across the continent. Why is it then that nobody is listening to the majority of the African women? who do not want these things. So we have a very high rate of refusal of contraceptive, contraceptive drug and, drugs and devices. We have a very um, high rate of discontinuity. So in other words, they bring in things like the IUD 
and the implants. Um, and the, by the following year, those women would have had it removed where possible, where they have access to a primary health care facility where they can get it removed. They discontinue the use of these drugs and devices. So very high rate of discontinuation and very low rate of uptake. So it's something that has been a quandary and a, an obstacle for people who are trying to promote these things. And yet they keep coming back uh, with even more money, with even more funding. So we find that what they are in fact trying to do is not to meet an unmet need. They are first trying to uh, kind of trigger a behavioral change if they can only get this behavioral change and have people start thinking about uh children in a in a certain way or motherhood in a certain way or you know or even sex in a certain way then they can they can get most of the people in society they're working very hard uh, and sometimes it's, it's really scary because if somebody's working hard and they have a lot of funding a lot of times you can see that they move, even if it's with some objection and some resistance, they're still trying to encroach into our uh, our societal life. And, you know, you as you were saying, um, you know, this isn't, so, there's a poor discontinuation rate. And you would think that any management campaign of any kind that's not showing success after year after year, you know, any management team should look and say, well, let's go and see, let's ask some questions from the folks, you know, we're working with and see what's the, What's the problem? Instead, it seems like there's an intentional ignorance of what African women want, um, which is really just really outrageous. And you know, part of that, you know, the UN um, uses language like a right. They want to provide a right to freely determine one's family size. Meanwhile, they're ignoring what you mentioned in the book, the very clearly stated and evidenced by surveys the desired fertility rates of the African women in these different countries are all very, very different um, from the Western ideals um, and um, or from these Western uh, uh, funders perceptions. And um, just, I guess, with these ideological imperialist funders pressuring African leaders with aid, to what extent do you think people have agency to, you know, you said some of them refuse do you think, what can be done to educate of the side effects and safe alternatives, like you mentioned, the evidence-based um, natural family planning methods that are quite effective without any of the health risks that, that these contraceptive campaigns come with? Yeah, I think the first uh, thing is to uh, understand that they, they, they have an open door at the like ministries of health. That's, that's usually about the first place these funded organizations go to. It's the Ministry of Health. They have an almost um, easy way in there because they're coming as if they're being, of course, they have been sent by the United States and the United Kingdom and the Netherlands and all whatnot. So it's the best way to, or if you are going to, to fight that or oppose that, um, to bring in the force of information, which is, you know, which I believe in, we are on the side of facts and we see these things you read it there is there is data that, that actually um that actually shows this these are the facts that co these contraceptives do have some very serious side effects and if you come to communities where you don't have this the the kind of health care facilities that you have in western countries then it's even much more problematic so again you you ask how can you bring the information i think it is you know, it, sh it should be the ambition, <laughs> it, it would be an ambitious one, but it should be the ambition of someone who is desirous or who, who desires to, to bring the right information to our communities to go to that point where our, uh, you know, contra these contraceptive organizations go to, you, you target the Western, uh, you, ta you target the African uh, health ministries and the African leaders, and some of them are open to the fact. Yes, of course, there are some corrupt ones who have already been won over, but I, I would, at least from experience, what I know is that I have met many, many members of parliament, members of cabinets of different African presidents who are saying, just give us the facts. We want to know because nobody really brings in the easy, you know, <laughs> the, the easy, um, easy, well compiled, 
data of what contraceptives can actually, the reasons why it's it's a problem for their communities, but they're getting the opposite of it, right? So we should t target to go to these African leaders at parliament, at ministries, and give them the opposing view of, of what we know. And you, you know, I know it's quite easy in the West for someone to just go online and you're seeing things on the internet, you're seeing things on social media. It's not the same for African leaders. If they are approached and they are, they are kind of um, told or given the information that is necessary for them to know, it is at least good because then when the, when the Marie Stokes and the IPPFs approach them, they have some challenge. And those people, as you know by experience, Planned Parenthood, what they cannot take is any challenge. They almost move without challenge. They don't want anybody to ask them. So what about side effects? Because they cannot defend these things. Um, also at another level, of course, is the community level is to try to, to get the information to the women themselves but as you know and as I, I have alluded to in this you know just a little bit before these people some of them don't have access to like the internet to social media so it's still the best way to try to get to them in their communities to try to get to them the same way that the contraceptive drugs and device uh, missionaries if I can call them that are getting to them we should be able to get to them and give them the information and disseminate these, uh, these types of information. Already, those who know are saying they don't want the contraceptive drugs and devices. And of course, on the, you know, on the, on the heel of that, if you are telling people there are these side effects, it's also, I think, a very compassionate thing to then offer the best options. Uh, we, of course, know about the, as you, you called it, evidence-based natural family planning methods, and they are there. And, you know, day and day, there are even more medical staff and healthcare professionals in the West who are dedicating their professions to it. So they do exist, but it's for us to be able to get, or for one to be able to get all that information as one into these African countries. But, you know, that still has not happened. Right, that this is an uphill battle. Even at Natural Womanhood, where we we do give access to information about these what they're what they're called in the scientific community here is fertility awareness based methods. Yes, and they are getting more attention, and they are scientifically backed, and there's evidence and research now showing that these are effective. And even yes. there are organizations that have taught them successfully across the world to all different literacy levels and different places. And so yes. there's so much untapped potential to sharing this natural these natural methods yes. with people everywhere um you know counterintuitively uh to some many westerners the what were you know what you documented in the book is how stds and unplanned teen pregnancies are on the rise even with these mm -hmm. contraceptive campaigns it's clearly not working in addition maternal health you know it's often said this these campaigns will help maternal health because we will stop maternal mortality if we just stop the pregnancies from coming. But that also hasn't been borne out in the facts. And as you were saying, as a scientist yourself, you know, just looking for the root, looking for the root problem is the key to trying to solve problems or meet needs in, in uh, African uh, communities. Um, can you just explain a bit about how this is a this is these efforts aren't reaching those needs for maternal health or um, or even reducing STDs or um, pregnancies. Yeah, so the, the about the maternal health, um, I think it is not only just them coming to say this is going to in a very simplistic way this is going to the contraceptives will help reduce maternal mortalities which is what they tell to countries as a whole so if a country has a really bad uh, or very high maternal mortality rate they sell themselves and sell their services and their products to entire cabinet saying this is your maternal mortality rate and this is this contraception Trust me, if you get this, you know, everything is going to everything is going to come to an end, everything is going to be solved. I think it is very uh, insidious and it's actually on the many levels, it's actually quite wicked uh, because it's a lie. <laughs> because it's a lie. The maternal mortality, that the high maternal mortality rates that we find just across the entire continent of Africa, um, almost without exception, is 
linked very much to things like women bleeding following childbirth and and that that's very well documented that you know bleeding is the is the number one cause of maternal mortality in in african countries um there there are also things like obstruction in in delivery and, and infections infection infections following delivery uh breach breach birth and and all of these things that uh, that you find that there is a huge need for improvement in obstetric care across the African continent. But once someone then comes in and gives you this panacea, this contraception that oh, don't, don't worry about anything else, of course, naturally, everyone then puts all their efforts, uh, all their time, everything that they've got into pushing this contraception that will then make things better in the country without really looking at the huge gap in our obstetric care. Um, so th this is how I believe that it has in fact been a setback. It's not only the fact that it's not been doing anything to help with our maternal mortality, high maternal mortality. I think it's kind of worsening it if, we, if truth be told when you look down at the, at the real facts because you come to a community, for example, where they don't have a good mater maternity care hospital or you know, there's no real good hospital where a woman can go to when she's pregnant for, for the kind of care that she needs leading up to birth, the antenatal care or the prenatal care. Um, and then you come three years later, there might be some Depo Provera program already in place, but still there is no obstetrician in that place the only obstetrician may have left, the only midwife may have relocated to another community. So things are getting worse when you are looking on ground, whereby uh, things that could have been done for maternal mortality and maternal proper maternal care, they're not being done. But then everything is being put in place in order to stock up what they call the stocking of, of, you know, of uh, local community uh, health centers with contraceptives. So women go there and what you're being told is to get this contraception so you'll be better. There's also another program that I find quite insidious, which is in place in, in a lot of the African villages. Uh, there are places where, especially where there is funding for it, there is this uh, post PPFP, the postpartum family planning, which a lot of times, if you look down at it, it is really linked. You can actually trace it back to some Western entity because it's not our Nigerian government or the Ghanaian government funding it. It's usually a USAID or a UKID or uh, you know, Canadian aid organization or, or Swedish aid organization, it's part of the entire family planning project that they have laid out for, you know, for the next couple of decades. A woman gives birth and then immediately after, right there in the, there in the theater where she's had her baby, she's being offered to have a tubal ligation or to have some kind of IUD put into her or to have some kind of shot given to her on that Day when she has only just had her child. So it's that there is a lot that is going on. And it's it really scares me be, sometimes because you find that we haven't even begun, begun to scratch the surface. And meanwhile, these uh, projects like the PPFE, the postpartum, uh, postpartum uh, family planning projects and, and so many others, you know, they are all there are people who are dedicated to promoting it. There are people who are who are getting promotions in Washington DC for some project that is going to be executed in an African village far away. Uh, and yet people are not really seeing it. Uh, so they they come as if they're helping us, but a lot of these things that they are doing, it's actually harming us. The STDs that you mentioned that I wrote about in my book, yes, of course, it's a no brainer. You don't even have to be a scientist like me to understand how, you know, coming to do a huge contraception project in a village can actually increase the level of STDs in that place. Because if uh, you bring in contraception, of course, the next natural thing that will happen is a change of attitude towards uh, sex, 
uh, and you know sex and intimacy and then it's the way people behave it's you know they, they, that behavioral change that they want because when they promote the contraception they're doing other things as well they're doing big parties they're doing raves you know and bringing in sex workers there are all these things that go hand in hand it's not just you know somebody clinically coming to do some just very clean project you know the depot provera no it will be a usually a party a big party a big a big rave they're doing a, what they call in africa Jamboree, you know, they're doing like a show, a bonfire. There's all these things that they do with it. They're trying to get people to let their guards down, you know, relax, have sex and have this, this, this one solution that we have for you. When you're doing that, if you're giving an IUD, of course, people are going to be going out, having, you know, very high risk sexual behaviors. And of course, that's at the point where we find STDs that are spreading in communities. And sometimes these STDs will lead to terminal diseases like HIV. So it's not, um, you know, it's, it's, an, it's not, you don't have to be a scientist to understand that. They are destroying a lot of things uh, and it's getting to the very core of a lot of the, our communities. And unfortunately, all of it will lead back to one thing. It's the money that is coming from the West, is the money, because without that money, without the kind of support that they have and political will that they have coming from the West, none of these things will happen. Our African governments don't have enough money to do these kinds of projects and programs. We have too many needs in our, in our countries. That's just devastating. And of course, you know, on, on Natural Womanhood, we have articles that show that Depo Provera is, is highly, um, highly, given out uh, in African countries. And it is, yeah. it is actually correlates with an increased risk of HIV. So yeah. um, a lot of folks are stuck with those side with those horrible repercussions. And like you mentioned earlier, and, and elsewhere in the book with the Norplant horrible story, um, how Western nations with repercussions and health risks, women, women stopped taking it in 1999 in, in Africa is still continued to be disseminated till yeah. 2008. And of course, these ladies don't have uh, class action lawsuits coming to help them. Um, just so sad. I, I really, I, I encourage everyone to, while we're, we're gonna wrap up because it's pretty soon, I don't wanna, I wanna encourage people to go back to the book for more on, on the population bomb narrative that is a false narrative of what's exp happening in Africa. Uh, I wanna, I want to um, just, you know, highlight what I really love, a line I really loved uh, where you described family planning. Um, I quote from the book, uh, it should be family plan, it should be family centered and should connote self-discipline for every good plan should be undergirded by discipline. I mean, how it's really, if it's called family planning, let's talk, it should be about family yes. and planning. I mean, That's it's exactly. just so, so, so basically put there that it just is Let's go back to that. Um, yeah. And and I, I just would love for you to paint a picture as we're wrapping up here of, of what empowered womanhood looks like for mm -hmm. the African woman to really bring us there to the extent that we can in this in this brief moment here. Um, you know, what does empowered womanhood look for like for the African woman? An empowered woman in the African context is a woman who is uh, first and foremost um, has the you know, the support of her family. She has the backdrop of her family. Uh, she is either someone's wife, someone's daughter, and she's seen in that light. That is the way African communities are. It's not this individualistic thing that we have in the West. It is the fact that you are part of a family, and so you are strengthened just to start with. For, by that mere fact, you have your community behind you. But uh, apart from that, in your own self as well, you have the confidence that has come from the fact that um, you have had your maybe some kind of training, uh, you've had good education, or you know you you have the the ability if you want to go out and be able to earn a living. You have that respect of your community, but not just being able to to make money as they say in the West, like you know the girl boss. No, it's really about the woman being able then to help to build her society. To you know, women have a special role. We all have this special quality about us that I think is God given. It's you know the woman is the one who civilizes society, and we're softer. We are much more. 
um, you know, we're, we're much more like a calming effect in, in society. And I think it's the same, whether we're in the West or whether you're know, in some African village, it's the same women kind of soften society, humanize society and call us back, you know, to that calmness. But this woman who is empowered is able to, to help to be in the, you know, to be part of the process of building up our society, helping to raise children, helping to train children, helping to, to, if there is a school, helping to teach the children there. If there's a hospital, you can be a nurse there, you know, for women who have that training. You, you want to be a part of the, just the, the very life of your community, but you also want to stand, not just alone, but you want to stand surrounded by your family and be able to get support from your family and in, in the same way, give support back. So it's really that, that women have this um, role of just being this, this, this sort of the soft center, the soft center of, of community, the very soft core of our community, the heart, if you like, whereas the men are the head and the leaders, but the women are the hearts. And so they can help to shape things and, and direct things in such a way that it's not hard, you know, it's not, it's not, um, you know, it's, too, it's not rough and, and they, 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 then they help to make our, our society much more beautiful, even with poverty and every difficulty that we have. It's the, those women that you find at a time of war or at a time of, you know, uh, where there is intense poverty or intense, you see women rising uh, to help be the that soft core of society that is soft and yet still g gives shape and direction to things. I love that. I love that heart woman or the heart. Oh, I love that. And just um, just for those who are unaware of how much the, the uh, babies mean to African women, just and you paint that very beautifully in the book, but just uh, can you explain how much the family and of their own, uh, the children that they raise, how much they're celebrated? For sure. <laughs> so everyone wants to hear about this. It's a, I was born into a, a community where where children are celebrated like you know packages from God. That when a baby is born, to start with, when somebody is pregnant, there is joy. Usually, there is much joy. People are very happy. And when I was growing up, I, I sometimes I found it a bit hard to understand why is everyone dancing and why is everyone celebrating? Oh, because the baby has just been born. So when a baby is born. And that baby is not just, you know, some extra person or the fact that, oh, my most wanted baby. No, it's the fact that every child comes as a sign of blessing from God, as a sign of hope, even if things are difficult. Every child, you know, comes with this mark from God or this mission from God that this baby, as long as we have this baby, there is hope. There is hope. And so, you know, so we keep moving on. So we love our children. We celebrate children when they are born. Uh, mothers, older mothers have to go to their daughter's homes when their daughters give birth to children, if you see what I mean. So it's, it's something that I, I always grew up with that, that my mother will always go whenever my, any of my sisters have a, have, will have a baby, she'll go and stay there for a couple of weeks. That's just culture for at least my own tribe. And I know a lot of the other African tribes do very similar things where, whereby we surround a woman who has had a child to give her that support that she needs. And that's why we don't we don't really hear things like postpartum depression. I never really heard of that until I came to the West. But it's not that I'm criticizing anyone who has had postpartum depression. Is the fact that uh, perhaps the society is not even doing enough to provide that support and love for the woman who has given birth because that that child that you've given birth to, it's not just that you've given birth to a child, you have given the world a gift. You know, it's that the gift mothers give, it's and that baby you've given birth to could be the hope of any community that that child is in and, and will have a long, you know, may have a long way in front of him or her to change in the world and bring in hope and bring in love. Every, every child comes uh, with, with a blessing from God. And that's, these are the things that we believe by culture, by tradition, and in the same way it reflects, you know, so, so so women, the, the first thing you want when you when you get married is just to start having children because that's just you know that is that is what it is. We consider them as blessings. It's just such a beautiful image. I, I wish we had that more here. Um, I do love that uh, that community support you described, and um, uh, thank you so much for sharing that. Oh, I, I just wanted to say you, you were saying there's the sign of hope and there's a the sign of unlimited. What could you know this child bring? I mean, your your family must be so proud of uh, the, 
<laughs> I'm not kidding. I just was, I was just, you know, I'm just so moved by your book and I just want to, um, I'm just, it's just a, it's just really a lot of great um, information for people to learn more about how, what really is needed in Africa and maybe how we can start to help before, before we, um, before we sign off, I would love to know how can people find and support your work at Culture of Life Africa? Wonderful. You can go to uh, www.cultureoflifeafrica.com, but you can also find me every day on social media. I'm on Twitter. I'm very active on Twitter at Obianuju, at O B I A N U J U. So you can find me there. You can ask me questions. Uh, you can, you know, comment on anything that I that I post. Uh, but I am very uh, vocal and active on on Twitter. You can also find me on Instagram for maybe, maybe a bit of a younger clan. <laughs> I'm not always there, but I'm there sometimes because my, my little nieces are there. So I like to just be in their way all the time. So you can find me there. I'm at obyanuju.ekocha on Instagram. Uh, and again, it would be wonderful to, you know, to kind of interact with you if, you if you have any questions or anything or you're reading the book and you have a comment to make about it. I would like to hear what, what you, you think about it. Well, I'm so glad we could speak. And again, I encourage everyone to pick up Target Africa and yes, connect on social media. We're so happy to have spoken, uh, to have this time to share uh, your experiences and your information that you've gathered in your work. Um, and so I, I hope everyone watching has found this as fascinating as I have. And for any other information on fertility, health and birth control side effects and natural family planning methods that are science-based, uh, please visit naturalwomanhood.org.